Hello, everybody, and welcome to Life Chef Podcast. We help you do the best you can with what you've got in the kitchen. And we've got a great show for you today. We have got a little Q&A with some questions. Let's get right to it. So the first question is, Hi, Tim. I am trying to get better at making roasts. Whenever I chuck one on for my family, the bottom of the tray always gets burnt and the meat is always tough. When I chuck on roast pork as well, the crackle is not crackly enough and always stringy. What should I do? Thanks very much for that question. So the question is, obviously, once you chuck your roast in, you probably notice that when you take it out, the bottom of it is obviously burnt. Now, to prevent this from happening, what you need to do before chucking your roast on, and this goes for most roasts, most roasts okay, is you want to cut up what's called a mirepoix. Now, mirepoix is like a chef term, but it's just a fancy word for onion, celery, and carrot, okay? So you want to roughly chop onion, carrot, and celery and leave it on the base of your oven tray, okay? Now, there's no need to peel the onion or the celery or cut it nicely. This is just going to be roughly chopped and left on your oven tray. So this just creates a bit of distance from your meat and the tray so that they're not touching, so that you won't get that sort of burnt burntness on there. And also the mirror pile will add a bit of flavor to the uh, roast for you as well. Okay. So once you've done that, you want to place the roast on top of your mirror pile and on the base of your oven tray, you want to place a little bit of water there as well. Because when you chuck that in the oven, the water will have to evaporate before your tray starts to burn. And you can just keep an eye on this throughout the uh, cooking process. Okay. So that that's going to really help you out and obviously, you know, getting anything that's sort of burnt on there it should uh, avoid the problem for you. Now, with your roast pork as well, the what you can do to make your crackle more crackly, okay, is do the same thing as what you would do with any other roast. Put your mirror pie on the bottom, a little bit of water so that that'll have to evaporate before it burns. So you follow the same principles there. But prior to chucking your roast in that baked tray, what I want you to do is I want you to cut away all that fat that's going to make you crackle and completely separate it from your pork, all right? And I want you to put that on a separate oven tray laying nice and flat, all right? Then what you're going to do is you're going to cover that in oil and plenty of salt, okay? The the secret to a beautiful crackle is to use lots and lots and lots of salt, all right? So season it with a lot of salt, a little bit of pepper, and then you want to place that on a separate tray into the oven, okay? That's going to allow the crackle to cook nice and evenly because when that fat's sort of going around the the roast when it's attached, a lot of that fat will be on the base of the base of the tray because it's wrapped around the pork, and you notice some parts of the crackle will be more crackly than others, and you'll be left with you know that stringy bit that you're referring to. So give that a try. On the separate oven tray, there's no need to put any water or anything like that with the pork, okay? Because that's not going to give you the crackle that you're after. And there's plenty of fat in that to make sure that it's not going to burn on the burn on the tray that you put in, okay? So thanks for the question. I hope that answers, uh, helps you out a little bit there. So next question, everyone, is for someone that has kids, what are some dinners that I can make that don't take a lot of time to cook? only have about an hour at most some nights okay thanks very much for that question so a lot of the stuff that you'd want to cook if you only have an hour in regards to meats would be stuff like chicken and salmon fillet stuff that doesn't take long to cook all right and it's generally salads are a good way to go a lot of the time the downside is it's can't be very filling but you can prevent that i'd use spinach instead of your normal you know mixed lettuce or anything like that The spinach just has a lot more nutritional properties and to make it a bit more filling, you can chuck things like couscous in there and quinoa, which is going to make it a bit more filling for you. I quite like some mangoes in my spinach in my salad, so feel free to chuck some mangoes in there, maybe some fresh cucumber, a bit of lemon juice, some parsley, a bit of red capsicum as well. And just use your lemon juice and your the juice from your mango as like your salad dressing. So there's no need, will be no need then to make, you know, a dressing for this particular salad because the tanginess from the lemon and the sweetness from the mango will work really well together to dress your salad and make it nice and uh, 
nice and beautiful for you, okay? And the same can be applied to, you know, any salad. It's nice and quick and convenient. Some beautiful brown rice as well would be, you know, something that you can make with the combination of both of the aforementioned, what we've mentioned there. <coughs> so, yeah, brown rice, some white rice, and just, you know, toss it with a bit of butter and seasoning, and you should be good to go there. So that should get you started um, and obviously help you save a bit of time there. The only thing that you'll really have to keep an eye on is obviously the salmon and the chicken, but generally salmon fillets, about 200, 240 grams, are only going to take 15 to minutes to cook uh chicken probably chicken breast probably around, around the same time so that should be you know fit within the window that you're sort of after of that you know one hour cook time all right so i hope that answers your question next next question we've got is uh for me cooking is stressful you have to time everything right you have the kids yelling and trying to control control them while not forgetting what i'm doing how can I make it less stressful? Yes, very good question. So I know a lot of people have kids and, you know, that can, can be stressful enough and when you're trying to time cooking and a lot of the times they don't like things. So I can understand the, uh, you know, stress. Thanks very much for the question. So one thing to make it less stressful is I would buy yourself a timer in the kitchen, okay, one of those little timers and you can use your phone as well. So... If the kids, you know, require your attention while you're cooking, I think we mentioned this a little bit in our last podcast, definitely get yourself a timer and set it, you know, for five minutes, every five minutes to for the timer to go off so that you don't forget what is on the stove and always leave what you've left on the stove on a low heat, all right? So that'll just enable you not to, you know, burn your food because if you're tending to the kids and you have to go back to the stove top, you know, so that's how accidents can happen. You know, we've all done it. You know, you're doing something, you get distracted and whatever you've got in the stove is overcooked and you have to start again and one hour's turned into two hours to two and a half hours. All right, so definitely buy yourself a timer. Also, I'd focus on cooking things that don't take so long to make. Like, obviously, you've got your beautiful roast and stuff, which we all love, but if, you know, you've got kids there and everything and you want it sort of done quickly... You know, it depends on the situation. One of the advantages of a roast is it takes longer to cook, but you can more or less just sit in the oven and you can just sort of wait. So I can see how for some people, you know, that maybe aren't, you know, constrained in time that way, but obviously just want to make it less stressful, a roast might be the way to go. But obviously if you're short of time and you've got the kids as well, maybe that isn't the way to go about it. And obviously remember potatoes, when you're cooking whole potatoes, they can take a while to cook as well. So just be mindful of what you're making. And, you know, if just make sure that you have a timer as well just to keep on top of things, all right? And a lot of the time, what you want to do is most of the time when you're cooking, you want to chuck your vegetables on last, okay? Because they don't really take a lot of time to cook, all right? And usually, you know, if you cut it the right size, obviously, you're not going to chuck a whole head of broccoli into the water. They'll take forever to, to, you know, to cook through. But obviously, if you're cutting, just say, broccoli into small little pieces... That's usually only going to take a couple of minutes for it to get nice and crisp for you before you can take it off the stovetop. So always be, you know, cooking your vegetables as sort of like a last minute thing. It doesn't matter if all of your other food is ready a couple of minutes before, you know, your veggies are, because if you've got meats or anything like that, that's going to allow it to rest. All right. So just, yeah, definitely get a timer. And I hope that helps you out a little bit. Next question, I want to make pasta a few days in advance to save time, but whenever I do, it always clumps together. What do I do? Thanks very much for your question. So, yeah, the quick way to sort of avoid this happening for you is once you've cooked your pasta, if you are making pasta a few days in advance, you want to make sure that the pasta is slightly undercooked, which is, you know, like a little bit under like al dente. All right, so when you take a bit of your pasta out of the pot. You want it to have a slight little crunch to it where it's not quite fully cooked. And then you want to strain it and rinse it under water to make sure that it is slightly undercooked because the next day when you recook it, that's going to continue the cooking process. And if you fully cook it the first time, it's going to be overcooked for every meal afterwards that, you know, you reheat the pasta. So yeah, definitely, you know, make sure that it's al dente. In regards to, you know, it's always clumping together. A quick way to avoid this is just to, Toss it in a bit of oil, okay? Cool it down first 
and then toss your pasta in a bit of oil and seal it in an airtight container in the fridge, all right? Definitely, if you don't have an airtight container, wrap it in glad wrap completely everywhere because if you don't wrap it in glad wrap, it's going to get this disgusting crust and you're not wanting to eat that. It's going to get, you know, like freezer burn or fridge burn on it and it's just not going to taste very well. But definitely toss it in some oil and then put it in the fridge and it's not going to get that clumpiness together that you're sort of talking about. And you don't stress too much because you probably think, oh, it's covered in oil. I don't want to eat it like that. Well, you're not, you're not going to eat it like that. That should sort of avoid it clumping up. What you're going to do is you're going to chuck it back into a pot and that's going to wash all the oil away that's on the pasta. All right, so I hope that helps you out. Next question. I want to be able to toss my pan to stir what food is in it without using my tongs. What is a fast way to get good at this without making a mess? Thank you very much for the question. So a quick way to do this, obviously, if you're trying it out, you know, obviously when you first start doing this, if you're trying to toss it with food in it, you can tend to make a mess on your stovetop. All right. So what I did when I was an apprentice, and I suggest you guys do this at home, is get the pan that you want to toss the food with and then just go grab some rice, all right, some uncooked rice and just put it in your pan and go out into the garden. All right. And then just go out in the garden and practice tossing your rice, you know, that isn't cooked in the pan to get used to, you know, doing it and just practice out there so that you're not going to make a mess of anything. The worst case, you're going to get some rice in the backyard. You know, it's no big deal. So definitely do that. Grab a pan and go out and practice, you know, 10, 15 minutes every night or how often you want. Obviously, the more you do it, the better you're going to get. And then you'll get used to, you know, the motion of tossing it like that. If you have time, you know, some YouTube videos, I know you're busy, but if you follow that principle, it should be fine. Um, It's, you know, it's a bit like muscle memory but that's a good way to practice everything there. So I hope you guys have enjoyed today's podcast. Feel free to shoot through any questions. I've got a great show coming up for you guys in a few days. This is Tim signing off. Take care, guys, and I'll see you soon. Ciao.